I want to talk to all of you about the cognitive processes that go through our mind when we're trying to be creative. Those are cognitive inhibition, fixation, priming, remote association, and incubation. Or, an easier way to remember this is creativity is fostered by patience, revision, and interaction. And we're going to visit this a little bit more in the end. For these, you can see that some of them tend to hinder our creativity. Others are in the middle, and other ones tend to actually help our creativity. And they're things we want to focus on fostering more. So I'm sitting here trying to think of an idea. And for some reason, the only types of thoughts that are coming to me are things that relate to what I did that day, or somehow, or something that just happened in the last week. And as frustrating as it is, it's a natural process in our brains that's called cognitive inhibition. It's like a barrier that we use to make sure the thoughts that we have are relevant to our everyday lives. And as frustrating as it is, especially since creativity is non-linear, meaning we're not trying to get from A to B as quickly as possible, which is exactly what cognitive inhibition is helping us do, we're trying to get there in a scenic route, where we're going from A to B in a longer way. But we can't just get rid of what cognitive inhibition is. A study by Healy and Rutledge in 2006 showed that 40% of children who are identified as highly creative were also identified as having the criteria for ADHD, or Attention Deficit Disorder. In other words, we need to find a creative sweet spot for us to be able to think of new ideas, a spot where we still have some rules and constraints, but we also have the freedom to come up with new ideas. Let's take, for example, J.K. Rowling. In 1990, she was on a train from Manchester to London, and the idea for Harry Potter literally just came to her. She's someone who we would consider to have fewer constraints meaning that she didn't need as many rules and regulations on her to be creative. Let's look at the other side of the spectrum. Someone like Theodore Geisel or Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss actually wrote his most famous work, Green Eggs and Ham, on a bet that he couldn't write a story in 50 words or less, which of course he did, and is therefore someone who has more constraints where when he has more rules, he's able to come up with more ideas. Each of us needs to find our own individual creative sweet spot, that perfect spot where we have enough constraints but enough freedom that we can be creative. When I'm thinking of ideas, I also find that once I think of one, all of my ideas are centered around that. It's actually our brain's process called fixation which is when one cognitive process is inhibiting another one. I'm sure many of you have witnessed this in the tip of the tongue phenomenon, that moment when someone's walking towards you and you know their name, but for some reason the only thing that is coming is that it starts with a J. So you just awkwardly wave and really hope that you don't have to call them out. And then later on you find out that their name's Laura. For those of you who haven't had to deal with that very socially embarrassing situation, don't worry, because we're actually going to recreate what happens in fixation with a short memory block test. So I'm first going to show you this word, analogy. And now, here's where the audience participation comes in, so I hope you guys are ready to talk. I need you to fill in the blanks for what you think this word is. So talk it out with the people next to you. Take a few seconds, and once you guys figure it out, are you guys ready? You want to shout it out? Allergy, exactly. And for those of you who are a little bit slower on it, don't worry, we have another one. <laughs> I'm going to show you the word catalog. And now, I want you to tell me what this word is. Talk it out with the people next to you. Anyone feeling confident? Cottage, exactly. This word is cottage. Now, while you were doing it, how, by a show of hands, how many of you kept seeing the word analogy or catalog in those words that you had to fill in the blank? Almost everyone. That's exactly what fixation is. Something is so similar to the other thing that it's getting distracted. So, what can we do to avoid it? Well, 
The first thing is the idea that quantity fosters quality. I know people have always told you that one is more important than the other, but when it comes to being creative, starting with as many ideas as you can, no matter how outlandish they may be, is actually a good thing because it means you're approaching a problem from multiple different perspectives, and that way you're not going to get fixated on just one idea. And the second thing is no sacred cows. If you really love an idea, chances are you're not going to think of anything else, even if there's a better one that's very close to it. So when you think of an idea you like, get rid of it. And try to think of all the other options before finally settling on that. We've just spoken about two cognitive processes that tend to inhibit our cre creativity. And now we're going to talk about priming, which does both help as well as hinder. Priming is when you have a word or an event or some sort of action that is influencing your brain to make certain associations. For example, if I said red apple and then asked you to name something yellow, chances are you're going to say a yellow banana instead of something like a school bus. Priming can be really useful for us, especially when we're in groups, because if one person says something, other people may get other ideas from it. But it can also be hindersome, because if one person says something, some people may only start thinking about what that person said, which is why the tool that we can use is perfect to be done when you're in a group, and it's called brainwalking. There can be as many people in your group, but for this example, I'm going to show two. Each person has a few minutes to, on a piece of paper, that says a problem to write as many solutions that they can think of that have to do with this uh, problem, different ideas they may have. And after a few minutes, everybody switches seats. So now that they see this paper with another person's ideas, and they have a few minutes, to write out any solutions or ideas that they may get from this person's own things that they wrote down. In other words, you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting primed from other people, but you're also giving a chance for you to come up with your own ideas. Now that we've spoken about these three processes, we're going to talk about two that really help our creativity. The first one is a remote association which is basically a connection that your brain makes between two ideas. If I said the word table and asked you to think for, of as many words as you can that are related to it, some person who is only to think, able to think of chair would have fewer remote associations, whereas somebody who, when they hear the word table, is able to say construction, wood, table tennis, has more remote associations and more ideas that they can draw from. One of the ways we can improve our remote associations, as well as creating and testing what we already have, is the random word association test. And this was created in 1962 by Mendick. So again, we're going to need some audience participation. In this type of activity, you'd be given three words. So for this example, we have sleeping, bean, and trash. And then we'd have to think of what is common between all of them. So for this example, it would be bag. Sleeping, bag. Bean, bag. And trash, bag. So are you guys ready to try some on your own? I see some nods, that's good. So now we have these words here. Flake, mobile, and cone. So talk it out with the people next to you, and in a few seconds, I'm going to ask you to shout it out. OK, what do you guys think it is? Exactly, a snowflake a snowmobile, and a snow cone. Now I'm going to show you one that's a little bit harder, in case you guys are feeling really good about that. Stick, maker, and point. Talk it out with the people next to you for a few seconds. Does anyone feel confident? Shout it out. Match, exactly. A match stick, a match maker, and match point. So now we know how to create these random word associations. And we're moving on to the last cognitive process that we have. One that I personally think is often ignored, but one of the most important ones. And that is incubation. Incubation is the rest period which your brain has where you have decreased cognitive inhibition 
and you have increased remote associations. An example is with my good friend Archimedes. I'm sure we all know the story of how he ran through the streets shouting Eureka, but there's more to it than just that. Archimedes was a mathematician, and the king had given him his crown and asked him to figure out if his crown was really made of gold. So Archimedes walked home with his crown, having no idea what to do. He was sitting there thinking, trying to figure it out, and nothing was coming. And he had to wait a few days anyway for the different pieces of metal to come so that he could even start checking things. So he decided to take a break from his idea. Sounds a lot like incubation. He then took a break and found his way to the shower. And while he was in this period of incubation, with decreased cognitive inhibition and more remote associations, he saw himself floating. And when he saw himself floating, he realized he could do exactly this with the crown. He could keep the crown and the various other metals on top of the water and watch their buoyancy and see how much they floated to see what the crown was really made of. And of course, we all know, he got really excited, jumped out of the shower naked, and ran through the streets shouting, Eureka! I'm not telling you guys to go do that. But what I am saying is to give it time. When you're trying to think of an idea, give it some more time. Either take a break, come back to it later, take a nap, and then come back and see what kind of ideas you can come up with. The second thing is to give yourself more options. The more you read, the more places you have to draw ideas from will create more associations so that during this incubation period, you have more ideas to take away. We've just spoken about these cognitive processes, some that hinder and others that help. But this is just the beginning. These ideas help us create our innate creativity and give us an ideal environment. But at the end of the day, creativity isn't in a vacuum. Which brings us back to that statement I said in the beginning. Creativity is fostered by patience, revision, and interaction. We need to work on our ideas, look at them multiple times, and talk to other people to help shell out what we want. Thomas Edison is credited with creating the light bulb in 1879. But he wasn't the only person doing this. In fact, there were many researchers and scientists who were trying to create a light bulb at the exact same time. Almost 80 years before Edison, we had already created an effective electric lamp. And Edison and his researchers spent about three years going over almost 3,000 designs to try and find this ideal light bulb. They happened to come across two Canadian inventors who had made a very successful electric lamp. Edison bought that patent. And with a few tweaks, he was able to successfully sell the first commercial light bulb. We need these cognitive processes to help create the ideal environment for us to be creative. But at the end of the day, just like Thomas Edison, all of our ideas need patience. We need to constantly revisit them, and we need to get other ideas from other people. Understanding these cognitive processes and the statement that creativity is fostered by patience, revision, and interaction can help us get the tools that we need so that we can create our next big light bulb idea. Thank you.